You know, there is coming a day very soon when we, we, when we will stand before him and be able to declare, my God, how great thou art. Amen? Do you long for that day? I cannot wait. Now, here's the awesome thing, the awesome news of, of this morning is we don't have to wait till that day to declare to him, my God, how great thou art, right? Our God is near. If you seek him, you will find him, and he meets with us. Is he here this morning? Amen. Does he promise to meet with his people? Yeah. Amen. Guys, this morning, we get to take the Lord's Supper, okay? So I want you to begin to prepare your heart even now. If you did not pick up these elements on your way in, if you would lift up your hand, deacons are coming through the aisle to make sure that you have these, Okay, and then mentally, I want you to prepare the entire service is gonna be moving towards the taking of the Lord's Supper together. Let me say now, if you are a born again believer, then we invite you, we welcome you to take the Lord's Supper with us, okay? This morning is gonna look a little different in the fact that uh, I'm actually gonna give an extended period of time between the sermon and the taking of the Lord's Supper for us to really make sure that we are not taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, okay? So let us prepare our hearts. Turn with me in your Bible to Acts chapter five. Acts chapter five. We've been walking through the book of Acts this fall. We will continue to so this morning, and let's just be straight up front. This is a shocking text to us. It is shocking, all right? It's Ananias and Sapphira. Let me give you the context of where we've been in the book of Acts, okay? As we've walked through, we've seen that, that Luke is, as he's authoring, uh, he, he is doing a very intentional look at the new temple that you and I, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, are now the living temple, of God, his presence is in us. And we've seen that movement, the magnificence of the new temple with, with these uh, idyllic statements of generosity and, and boldness and being filled with the spirit, this passion towards prayer. And that is being put in, in stark contrast to the old temple and the leaders of the old temple. It's, it's a stark contrast of this new temple and the life that we have there, right? So there, there's passion for prayer, generosity. There's, there's a unity. But as we will see this morning, not all is perfect in this new temple, okay? Not all is perfect absolutely pristine. So let me give you an overview of what happens. That is, after Barnabas presents his money, we, we then get a quick snapshot of, of a couple named Ananias and Sapphira who come and, and lay their offering before the apostles' feet. And as we'll, we'll learn, they, they held some money back and they wanted to be perceived as giving it all. And the Lord struck them dead. Right there, in that spot, in front of everyone. Struck them dead. Shocking. Okay? It has been preserved for us. Very important message about worshiping the Lord this morning, okay, about coming with sincere hearts before him without a pretentiousness, and, and you're going to hear me conclude with this phrase, playing church, okay, that's the press this morning, so let's pray as we jump into it. Our Heavenly Father, right now in Jesus' name, we pray for your Holy Spirit to continue to move amongst us. And we welcome you right now to search our hearts, to see if there is any wicked way in us, God, that you would expose and that you would call us to repentance 
Because spirit, when you convict, you heal. And you call us to life. And you point us to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross where we can come and find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. And and you call us forward to walk with you and to know you. God, do not allow us to go through this day, this morning, playing church, being being pretentious in any way, God, but, but being unified with one another, praying for one another, and just wanting to have a clean heart before you, God. That is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 4 the last two verses, verse 36 and 37. Now, now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who's also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement. He owned a tract of land and he sold it and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, undoubtedly, the, the news of Barnabas's Generous example, it spread. You see, because instead of dreaming about comfort and security and the, of the fina- financial excess that, that Barnabas had and all that that would do in his life, instead he dreamed about how that, that could be used to meet the needs of those less fortunate who are in the body and how God's kingdom could be expanded. And the, and the early church was exploding right there in Jerusalem. And the good news of Jesus Christ, it's, it's not dependent upon socioeconomic status. The good news is for all, especially the poor. Now, given Barnabas's incredible character that you will see all through the book of Acts, what becomes very apparent is that his offering is completely genuine. It is, it is not ostentatious, but rather he is a model of modesty and humility. Now, a newly converted couple named Ananias and Sapphira, they were grabbed by the way that Barnabas' name and reputation was spreading for his generosity. Very few were in similar situations where where they were able to sell an additional piece of property and come and to take those proceeds and lay them at the apostles' feet to give that money to the poor of the church. They sat up late at night discussing what most likely began with, with good motives. Hey, we could sell our property and give. That conversation soon got sideways with, hey, think of all the attention that we could get for our generosity. Maybe their land was larger than Barnabas's and would sell for even more. Hey, what would it look like if we gave twice as much as Barnabas? Before long, Anyone who would listen knows of their plan. You see, discretion was never a consideration. And when the sale went through, it was even better than they could have thought. Because there was enough money there to outgive Barnabas and be able to hold back a large portion for themselves so that they could have safety and security, so that they could have all those things too. And no one would be the wiser. It was the perfect plan. They could have their moment in the sun of being just as generous as Barnabas. Giving it all. Seen as giving it all. And keep back a a portion for their own comfort and security. Verse 1. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. 
You see, the whole day has been planned out. Ananias would go first. At at the most obvious, most visible time to go, making sure that lots of people could see him is the opportune time to go and to lay the money at the apostles' feet. And And then his wife would be slightly delayed so that she could come and have her moment in the sun too. They've clearly advertised it and they're going to keep a portion back for themselves. You see that phrase there in verse two that says kept back? Luke intentionally uses a rare Greek word Okay? It's, it's only used one other time in the New Testament, and that is in Titus 2.10, where there the word means pilfer. All right, And here it's called to call our minds to a particular Old Testament text. Because only once in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, that is in Joshua 7.1, is this word used. And it's used in reference to Achan's sin. Remember when when Israel was going into the promised land? Achan was outright disobedient because after they had conquered uh, Jericho, the instructions were that they were to destroy everything. But Achan had taken bars of gold and pieces of silver and had hid it, kept back that money in his own tent, hid it underneath his bed. Now, Achan, along with all of his possessions and his family, would be stoned and burned before Israel was allowed to continue the conquest of the promised land. Because Achan had had, uh, kept it back, they would lose the battle of Ai. The, The whole community was, would suffer underneath this. Now, keep this in mind. Keep this scripture passage in mind because here in the New Testament, right, the new temple, God is moving mightily, all right? And God won't be stopped by the deception of a few. Amen. Verses three and four, but Peter said, Ananias Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God." All right, I want you to note Peter's polarizing language, all right? He is not pulling any punches. He is being very forthright. Satan has filled your heart, and you have conceived this idea in your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Now, remember from last week, I want us to also notice Peter's flow of his argument here, okay? He says, while this was unsold, did it not remain your own? What is he saying? He's saying, listen, no one is forcing you to sell anything. In fact, no one asked you to sell anything. You have the right to personal property. And after you sold it, was the money not yours? Right? There's no demands that you would give a certain percentage, much less give it all. You have conceived all of this with evil intentions to make it look like you were giving all. And in doing so, you are lying to God. All right, so I know this is shocking to us, but we have to be absolutely clear what Ananias' sin was. He faked a deeper spiritual commitment and generosity than what he actually had. 
Why? Because he wanted the applause and the acclaim, the adoration of other people. He wanted others to think that he was more spiritual than he was. And he valued the attention that would come from fellow man so much so that he was willing to deceive them to get it. And all the while, while he's fearing man, he has no fear for God. You see, long forgotten is the aspect of true worship and love for God himself. You see, this act of of posturing for influence, it treats God as if he is needy, as if he is indebted to Ananias. Oh, I'm sure I'm so glad and thankful that Ananias is on my team. I don't know what I would do with my church if I didn't have him. Verse 5, and as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard it. And then in verses 6 through 10, it says that young men come and take Ananias immediately out and bury him. And then after a short delay, just as planned, so that as much so, so, so that she could get her moment in the sun too. Sapphira comes right in, and Peter looks at her and asks the question, Is this the price you sold the land? And then says, Why have you tested the Spirit of God in this way? In verse 10, and immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried, out, uh, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And a great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard these things. A great fear. You're darn right a great fear fell over everyone. I mean, can you imagine? No, no one is saying, well, you know, they had high blood pressure. It was bound to happen at any moment, right? They were, they were on the verge of dying. No, 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 no. It is like, it is incredibly clear that their sin on full display has received immediate judgment and they fell dead right there. Now, there's one other important piece of biblical context, right, that we need to bring in to understand this passage clearly, and then we're going to apply it to ourselves. All right, that's Leviticus 8 through 10. All right, Leviticus 8 through 10. You need to think all the way back. Remember, coming out of Egypt on Mount Sinai, uh, Moses gets instructions to build the tabernacle, okay? That's the tent of meeting of God. And at the end of Exodus, the tabernacle is finished and the spirit of God, the Shekinah glory of the Lord enters into the tabernacle. All right, so that's where we end in the book of Exodus. Now, next book is Leviticus, right? The Levites, the priests, the entire emphasis now shifts towards the priests. And the first seven chapters of of the book of Leviticus are all about the types of offerings that you are to bring, okay? Then you pick up our story in chapter 8, because chapters 8 through 10 are going to be about the consecration of the priest, because they are finally going to enter into the tabernacle, okay? Does that make sense to you? So in chapter 8, Moses, right, because he's the only one who's now allowed to enter the tabernacle. And you need to think about this, how Moses is a type of Christ, okay? Because God has entered the tabernacle, and, and now Moses goes in there, and he takes oil, and he anoints everything in the tabernacle. 
okay, on, on the altar, on the lamps, everything is anointed by Moses with oil. And then he goes and he begins to anoint the priests. He, he anoints the, the priests themselves and their garments. And then Moses does the same thing, but now with blood. Okay, there's a sacrifice and he's going to take blood and he's going to put it on the priest's right earlobe and right thumb and right big toe. Okay, all of this is in consecration of the priests. Okay, and then they have to wait seven days. They're going to camp in the gate of the tent, uh, uh, in the very front. They're going to camp in the gate for a whole week. And Moses tells them, don't move, because if you leave this spot, you will die, okay? So they stay there a whole week. Now, on the eighth day, it's going to be the first time that the priest, Aaron, and his sons will finally be able to offer sacrifices, okay? So everyone gathers around. This is in Leviticus 10. Everyone gathers around because it's the first time that the priests are going to be able to enter the tabernacle. Now, during this monumentous first occasion, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, they take their own fire pans, they put some sort of incense in it, and all the scripture tells us is that they offer an unauthorized strange fire. Then it says this. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. You see that picture? God had already indwelt the tabernacle. They are out front with their saucepans. They are Oh, this is awesome. This is their moment in the sun. This is their time to shine. And they offer a strange fire in their saucepans. And fire comes from the tabernacle and consumes them. Right there before their father Aaron and their uncle Moses and all of Israel. Imagine the hush that went over that crowd. And then Moses speaks because God told him clearly, say this. He said, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. In fact, repeatedly throughout the Old Testament, God acts in swift judgment over improper worship. You see, the kingdom is removed from Saul after he offers unauthorized sacrifice uh, before a battle instead of waiting on Samuel the priest. After David establishes Jerusalem as his capital, he, he wants to set the tabernacle up right next to it. And he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant in and, and enter into the tabernacle. But, but as they transport it, they transport it in an unauthorized way. And when the oxen stumbles and the Ark of the Covenant is going to fall off the cart that it was never supposed to be on, Uzzah reaches up to touch the Ark to keep it from falling off and God strikes him dead on the moment. Shocking examples. You say, well, that's the old covenant. This entire section in the book of Acts, Luke has been teaching us about the new covenant, guys. Christ has come, and he is the fulfillment of the temple, the priesthood, and the sacrifices. Praise God that in Christ, God's presence now fills his people, and we are the living temple. And Luke has been putting that in shocking contrast, in contrast to the old temple. And now, as we've found and seen, right, I, I'm being truthful here, that there is a freedom that whomever wherever, whenever the people of God can meet. And yet right into this first formation of the new temple, God strikes Ananias and Sapphira dead for irreverent worship. 
You see, just because there's freedom in Christ's blood, and we no longer come underneath the old ritual of Levitical washings or Levitical clothes, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Yes, it is Christ who has come to make you clean. And he clothes us with his righteousness. And he has freed us from the cultic practices of outward things that make us unclean. That is no longer the case. But listen, that freedom is not to be confused with an irreverent heart that does not fear God, that does not treat him as holy. He is not a tame lion. He dwells in unapproachable light. Why would the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was and is and is to come, why would he accept secondary worship from those who are genuinely just seeking the approval of other men? Why would he accept worship when all of our attention and focus is on other men? I mean, playing pious churchgoer, a hypocrite in life, you know that word hypocrite? It, it, it's derived from, from someone who wears a mask. Because fake, pretentious worship is an abomination to God. I mean, isn't that what we see here, guys? Right, that God is moving. God is moving in the early church. It's exploding. Thousands are being saved. They're being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. They're being bold in their witness, right, to keep on speaking. They're unified. They're generous. Unlike ever before, there is awe and wonder at all that God is doing to move, right? And you say, wow, God is moving. And then wham. Two fall dead for hypocritical worship because they're pretending to be more generous, more spirit filled than what they actually were. And a great fear went through the whole church and all who heard. Can you imagine the soul searching? In the prayer meetings that they had after this. Guys, what if God gave us immediate justice? Whenever we play to the audience of man and irreverently diminished God in our hearts. I can tell you this, you wouldn't have a pastor. I mean, how many times have we insinuated that our prayer life is more robust and more frequent than reality? How many times have we sought the appearance of generosity, right? Because that is our reward, the appearance of generosity. Growing up, I had a, I had a family member that, that when I would go to church with them, I would notice that they would always put a dollar in the plate every time. And so I asked him, I, I said, I said, why do, why do you put a dollar? And he said, well, I, I give via check once a month. But every time when the plate is passed, I put a dollar in because what would other people think if they saw me in the plate and I didn't put in a dollar? How many times have we misrepresented our spiritual effectiveness embellished God's use of us in a circumstance. I mean, how often do we come in here week in, week out and play church, right? Giving the appearance that we have it all together. As far as everyone knows, we're a normal family, okay? Keeping everyone at arm's length away. When in reality, we come in and we are in desperate need of prayer for our walk, for our marriage, for our children, 
And in a day when the American church is all about marketing and brand and image and vibe, and Christians are consumers of convenience and preference, guys, this passage demands that we search our souls and that we ask, what must it look like? All right, for God to be pleased with our worship and for God to move amongst us. What must it look like? So as we transition to the Lord's Supper, this morning, guys, we're gonna give an extended period of time to make sure that we are not taking this in an unworthy manner. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul specifically says this, right? Some of you are sick and some of you are dying because you are approaching the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. You say, well, no one's dying around here. Well, maybe that's evidence that God is not moving amongst us in might and in power. So all around the room, guys, we're going to have uh, people stationed just for prayer up here at the front. And, and I'm going to give you like five minutes to prepare your heart to take the Lord's Supper. That you would say to God, search me and know me. See if there is any wicked way in me. If, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. But if we say that we have no sins, we are a liar. And the truth is not in us. So what relationships do you have that need to be mended? What has been the attitude of your heart this week? Has it been filled with contentment for the Lord? Or are you discontent? Longing for the things of the world. Prayer team, go ahead, move, get in place. The other thing I want you to know is Guys, we, sh we show up on Sunday morning, we, we put on our best for the Lord, and this is a beautiful sanctuary, but the reality is, is this is just a house for the people of God to meet. And so if you need prayer with a brother and sister, they're here. And I pray that we would not be so worried about what everyone else thinks that we would be fearful to stand up and pray with our brother and sister. So you prepare your heart to take the Lord's Supper. And I ask many of you, please stand up and, and pray with your brother and sister around you. for prayer, guys.
continue to do business with the Lord. I'm going to read Psalm 24 for you. The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains. The world and all those who dwell in it. For he has founded upon it the seas and established it before the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and has not sworn deceitfully. Can you say that of yourself this morning? He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Okay, I want you to take the elements. I want you to open them. I want you to prepare them. I just read a portion out of Psalm 24, right? It asked the question, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Right? Who, who could ever enter into God's temple and be found in his presence? Only those who are perfectly clean, embedded in there, is our desperate need for a Savior. Amen? Our desperate need for a Savior. The psalm ends like this. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? He is the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head, O gates. Lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. See, God has sent his Son so that by his death, burial, and resurrection, our sins can be forgiven. We can know for certain that the price has been paid. See, when God convicts, God heals. He offers the solution, and the solution is always himself. And so while we're shocked by this passage this morning, what it should do is force us right back to the cross of Christ. Amen? And so in here, in just a moment, as we take this together, represents his body that was broken for us, broken for our sins so that we might have forgiveness. Matthew's gospel records it like this. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Next, I want you to prepare the cup. The cup is a picture of his blood and the new covenant and the victory that is ours on the other side of the cross. See, the purpose of us being contemplative, the purpose of us, of us pressing in and making sure that our hearts are right in worship this morning is not to be heavy-handed or over-authoritative, Rather, it is to know and to understand that it is in the name of Jesus 
that he makes us clean. But then he gives us the ability to walk out in new life. It's the certainty, beloved, that your sins have been paid for in full. And so I'm going to give you just a moment to contemplate that you're holding the cup of victory. That is that you are completely accepted in Jesus Christ. Celebrate that and we'll take it together. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Would you pray with me? Our heavenly father, King Jesus, we are so grateful that you would accept us that you would allow us to come before your throne. Father, forgive us. We never want to approach in an unworthy manner. We always want to allow you to examine us, Father, and to allow us to confess our sins so that we can find forgiveness and nearness with you, God. Forgive us whenever we are so overly concerned about the cares of the world and the approval of man. God, we want you to move amongst us. Give us a clean heart so that you would move amongst us, so that you would accept our worship always in the name of Jesus Christ. Continue to allow us to walk out in newness and freedom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.